Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. grew up uh, hearing Brother Copeland preach, and um, uh, many, many uh, years ago, he was known as the preeminent evangelist in Pentecost, preached many, many great revivals across this country, and uh, I've, I've come in contact, met many people across the country that have said, I prayed through in a revival, Brother Tim Copeland preached. He's had, an, had an, a great impact uh, for the gospel and on many, many souls. He's uh, uh, pastor in a great church in Buford, Georgia. I was blessed many years ago, nearly 20 years ago, I guess now. I think I was one of the first preachers that uh, preached for Brother Copeland. And I did so well. He's never had me back since then. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing, but uh, I stayed with his family in their travel trailer and preached for them. And uh, I tell you what, uh, he has built a great revival church. God is still using him in a mighty, mighty way. And I wonder if we would just open up our hearts today and let the man of God preach to us for a few moments. Are you going to help the preacher preach? You're not all preached out yet, are you? Why don't we put our hands together and let God know, let Brother Copeland know we're going to help the preacher. Brother Copeland, we love you. Appreciate you. Hallelujah. And praise the Lord, everybody. It is such a privilege and an honor to be here uh, today. And uh, I just thought last night when I got here and saw all the good men and young men in this place. What a beautiful, beautiful sight. Uh, sometimes if we're not careful, we feel like we're almost alone. And uh, there's a world around us that's trying to get us to conform to its uh, idea of things. And, but I, I look out and I see precious, precious men. Men that's taken the time to come to a men's conference and hear the word of the Lord, uh, men that I believe has got a real hunger to do things better. I don't think any of us is perfect. And uh, probably if we could go back, I know there were some things that we'd like to improve on, but uh, to know that we still have a desire to, to be the men that God wants us to be. I know that we cannot do that unless God helps us it's not in us to direct our what paths and uh, to make the right choices and decisions but uh, I'm glad that God's here to help us he loves us he's merciful to us and we're not here because we're good we're here because he's good and it's not really so much of what we've done but it's what he's done that uh, we're able to be here today, and I thank God for that. Thank God for that. I salute Brother Townley uh, for what he's doing here, and uh, I hope all of us will try to help uh, 
in special ways. With uh, takes a lot of money to put something like this on, but uh, it's been his burden, and uh, I'm just amazed to, to look at the results of this meeting and what the Lord is doing. Certainly, uh, manhood is under attack. Men are under attack, and uh, the devil knows the influence. Like we heard last night, the influence of men. And, uh, and so he tries to relegate us to a uh, sector of the population that just really don't count very much anymore. But I'm, I'm glad for Bible principles, I'm glad for the truth of the Word of the Lord that helps us if we'll listen to what this book says and not what society says. And uh, so I thank the Lord for this apostolic church and thank God for the privilege of being here. Uh, what tremendous, tremendous preaching last night. Influence is so important crazy thing about influences uh, I'm afraid that the times that we have the most influences are times that we're not even aware like a Paul and a Silas singing and praying at midnight and the prisoners heard them they, they weren't singing for the prisoners they were singing because they had something inside of them and they prayed and then they, they sang but there was somebody listening. And, uh, oh, there's somebody watching. So glad to have my oldest son here today. I love him, Jordan. And uh, glad that he's here. And uh, I feel like the greatest success that I can ever have is those that know me best would love me the most. And uh, I thought about preaching today about bringing it home. I'm not going to do that today, but it's all what happens at home. It's what we get home with after we've shouted and ran and talked in tongues. It's, it's what we bring home. Something about the glaring, scrutinizing lights of home that reveal what we really are. And we may fool the preacher, we may fool the church, we may fool people on the job, but we don't fool those that we live with. And uh, this is an hour where we need to take it home. We need to get home with it. But uh, anyway, I'm, 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 I'm honored to be here. Great, great preaching today. I, I wanted Brother Fox to just keep on preaching. I tell you what, he is talking about getting off the porch. You know, I was always told, don't get off the porch unless you're a big dog. And uh, I feel like staying on the porch today. <laughs> this has been wonderful. This has been good. At the same time, I, I refuse to feel that I have to compete. We're not here to compete. We're here to complete. Hallelujah. The church is something different from anything else. And uh, the whole thing that is so valuable in part of it is being in God's hand. Just being an instrument. You don't have to use fancy tools, so we shouldn't get proud. If God decides to do something wonderful while we're preaching, He uses weak things to bring down mighty things, foolish things to bring to naught. Thing, you know, wisdom and even things that don't exist to bring to naught the things that do exist. And so, hallelujah. I want the Lord to, to help us today. Uh, hallelujah. This, this Again, this has been, been so good. And uh, I don't know really, uh, I may kind of change the, uh, kind of the rhythm and, of things, not... I'm certainly wanting to be in the vein of everything that's going on, but I may just uh, give you a little lesson today to, to take home with you. I want to read something that I'm not going to tell you where it's at in the Bible until just a little bit because I don't want you to get to reading it and looking around and seeing what we're dealing with. There's some of you that when I start reading this, you'll 
you all know what this is, but um, anyway. And here it is. They helped everyone his neighbor. Ever lived in a subdivision like that? They helped everyone, his neighbor. And everyone said to his brother, be of good courage. Now, I don't think that the word of the Lord ever exaggerates anything. I believe that right here, everybody was helping their neighbor. And then when it came to church, everyone said to his brother, be of good courage. You know, I've been trying to preach now for 45 years. I, I had never preached in a church where everybody said to his brother, be of good courage. <laughs> so the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith. And he that smootheth with a hammer, him that smote with the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Now that looks like a model church. That's look, that looks like the kind of church that every preacher here today would dream of pastoring. Where everyone helped his neighbor. Where everyone said to his brother, be of good cheer. This is found in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 6 through verse 8. And it looked like just to read it, a group of angels where everyone's getting along and everyone's encouraging each other. and Everyone is doing whatever they're supposed to do on the job and they're very thorough at it. And they actually seem to be uh, very cheerful and courageously toiling. They're prompt. They're industrious. Uh, they're all working toward a common end. There's a quality to their work as they fasten it with nails that it should not be moved. I mean, they're, they're trying to build something that is good and uh, will last. The truth of the matter is, this is a group of idolaters. And the truth of the matter is, they're, they're building idols. And they're working together in sweet harmony. Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing? And so I want to talk to you about a few lessons that we could learn from idol makers. God, we love you. We thank you for your words. Speak to us today. Help us today. Talk to us today, God. God, I want to obey you today, God. I feel like this is what you want me to talk about today. Help us today, Lord. Help us today, God. We love you, Lord. We praise you, God. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. God bless you. You can be seated. There's a lot of things that we don't need to be influenced by the world. Uh, in some things. There's other things that the world could teach us something if we would be willing to listen. Of course, the Bible says of those that come into the kingdom, there's not a lot of mighty. There's, there's not a lot of outstanding as far as the world perceives, I want to tell you, God makes us much better than we could ever be without Him. 
But the Bible says in Luke 16 and verse 8 that the children of this world and their generation are wiser than the children of light. And sometimes we can learn some amazing things uh, by, by the world and the way they operate in some things. It's amazing to me to, to witness the ability of wicked people to get together and work out their differences and search diligently for places where they can be in harmony and support and help. The Tower of Babel is a testimony to the fact of what can happen when, when wicked people get together. God actually got in a hurry of going down and confounding their language because they were so together. And even though they were not like God, they had been made in God's image and there was something in these people that they wanted to build a tower uh, into the heavens. You know, in politics, it's, it, it's amazing the disharmony that is among conservative so-called people. And it's amazing the solidarity that is found among liberals. I mean, we're seeing it right now. It seems like conservative people just have a problem working together and finding places to, uh, to agree on things. You look at the liberals and, man, it doesn't matter how wide the spectrum is. When the time comes, they get together. Hallelujah. Now, I, I know I could get myself in trouble and people could misjudge some of the things that I'm saying. But I trust that some of you have known me long enough to know who I am and what I am. But, but it's amazing how that, you know, it's just, of course, it's, it's kind of the nature of things. You know, when you're conservative, you've... You've got some strong opinions and you've got some strong beliefs about things. And I understand the other side of this is that we just can't hunt with any dog. There's some core values that we have that will never be compromised. Hallelujah. That's right. But there's some things that may not be heaven and hell issues that... We're all trying to get to the same place and perform the same or, or produce the same product of God's church and His will. But there may be a little variation on how that we approach. You know, there are some methods that work good for some people and, and they don't work good for other people. Hallelujah. I, I, I knew a man in California, a, a great man. His name was Ike Terry, Brother Ike Terry. A very opinionated man, and a man that just look you right in the face real quick and tell you the way it was. And uh, he was a great man. He put out many, 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 many preachers. I wouldn't advise everybody to pastor the way he pastored. It was him. It was his personality. He had a way of handling people. Uh, I, I'm getting into some things I never intended on getting into, but. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it's amazing. It, it is amazing. And, and then when you think of the importance of, of people getting together and what happens when people are truly united in the will of God, that one can put a thousand to flight and two can put ten thousand to flight. And so these, these men, they were working together. And uh, uh, they were finding out what their specific trade and job was. And uh, it, it seems to reflect that all of them were masters at whatever they were doing, and they were doing it well. 
And, uh, but yet they were not so busy that they failed to take the time to encourage the other craftsmen in what they were doing. They were working on something the Bible says that was not going to be lasting. What they were involved in was not worthwhile. They were working for the wrong cause. It was a useless cause. It was a cause that God said in the 11th verse of this chapter, they shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. You know, everything that the world is working for and striving for and pouring themselves into, if it's outside of the will of God and God's plan, it will eventually come to naught. I'm glad I'm not traveling down a dead-end road. I'm glad I'm not pouring myself into something that when I die, everything that I've done will be of no value. There are people that never catch on to the punchline of life and what life is all about. They, they specialize on little areas that really, really are not life changers. I think of somebody that is a relative of mine through my, fam my, my wife, and, uh, and uh, they're, they're given to education, college professors. And one man has given his whole life to the study of, of ancient Chinese religion. And he travels all over the world making lectures. He has claimed to be the world's first and foremost authority in that subject. I'm glad I'm giving myself to something that's far more reaching than that. Hallelujah. I'm glad that when it comes time for God to call me home, it will not be the shutting of a door of, of what I've been involved in and it's over with. But it will be an opening to what I have worked for and I have given myself for. And I have consecrated, consecrated myself to accomplish. And so these men are doing whatever they're doing and it seems to be something that moves the heart of God. So when we read about what they're doing and how how thorough they are and how consecrated and, and focused they are and how they are, they are so interested in others around them and working together to produce something that will come to nothing. And it's almost a cry that I hear from God in verse 8 when it says, But thou, Israel, art my servant. Jacob, who I have chosen... The seed of Abraham, my friend. I believe that he's making a statement that has been motivated by the previous verses. Look at what these men are doing. And it's going to be nothing. But I believe that God is trying to wake up people, His people that are chosen, to realize you're people of destiny. You've got something that's not going to come to nothing. Hallelujah. You're not going to lose all things. It, it is eternal things that you're involved with. You know, a man that lives his life void of the things of God and, and he spends his time on those things that will not last. Hallelujah. It, it's a horrible thing for a man to not realize what life is all about. But the greatest day of a man's life is when God comes and flips the lights on in his life. And he realizes that it's more than just a job or an occupation or a house that you live in or a car that you drive or pleasure or prosperity or recognition and fame from those that are around you. We got a world of people that's climbed all the way to the top. Look at Hollywood and look at the people that, that commit suicide, just like the comedian just a while back, and they made a hero out of this man. Instead of realizing, you know, took the road of suicide, left a boy behind, 
and those that loved him and were so twisted in values and they've made a hero out of him. But all oh, to realize that when, when uh, we pass from this life and the tide of life takes us out and uh, that there is something eternal. There's eternal value. You took time to come to a men's meeting. You've sat here and there's a hunger. Oh, I felt it from the very first. There's a hunger. Oh, we want to do better. We want to go further. We want to do a better job in what we're doing. Hallelujah. Oh, I thank God for the Holy Ghost that I feel in this place today. Hallelujah. Every pastor would love to pastor a church that their attitude was the attitude of these idolaters. People cooperating, people finding their own talent and job and, and uh, helping one another at the same time, encouraging each other, and walking to get, working together for the same goal. You know, when I, when I talk about uh, getting together, I, I'm not talking about uh, uniformity. I, I'm not talking about, at least in some areas... Of, of everybody doing the same thing. And I, I do know that we need to be on the same page. And, uh, you know, uh, in, in some ways we, we do need to do some things exactly, you know. But, uh, you know, in, in other ways we, we need diversity and need to understand the value of diversity among our churches. Now, I'm a little reluctant to even use that word because... Most of the time when we hear it in our culture and time, it's talking about something else. But uh, I want to tell you, God is not trying to make us like, you know, just everybody. We, we don't need cookie-cutter Christians. <laughs> Hallelujah. We, we don't need to all be trying to do the same thing. Hallelujah. God has made us. And we are different from any other person that God has ever made since the history of man's existence. The more you find out and study, the more uh, the world uh, studies the, the human. And we, we, rely, we realize that every one of us, we're, we're, we're not a carbon copy of anybody. They found out many years ago about the fingerprint. And it's just blown people's mind. Not always much of an explosion, but... Uh, just blown their mind that, you know, every fingerprint, uh, everybody's different. And now they're finding out that people's eyes are different. They've got cameras in some of the airports that can scan several, you know, maybe a hundred people walking down a terminal. And, and these cameras are so, they're, they're, they're so advanced that they can, they can, they can study the pupil of, of every eye. And uh, if, if they've got it on file, if, if there's somebody that's a criminal or a terrorist and, and they've ever got a picture of that, I, I want to tell you, nobody's eye is exactly the same. One thing I can't figure out, they just recently said that the earlobe, you, you, you can identify people by the earlobe. To me, they fairly, look fairly, fairly close alike. What I'm saying is that we're all different. You know, I, I evangelized 21 years, tried to, and uh, I went to a lot of churches. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I saw a lot of things. Churches are different. I, I'm glad churches are different. All right. Amen. Hello. I, 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 I thank God for some differences that I found in churches. There was a few times as soon as I stepped in the door the first night. Hallelujah. It was so obvious. Hallelujah. Not that I knew. I, I, a lot I didn't know until I started pastor, but I thought I knew a lot more than what I knew. But, uh, you know, there were some things I'd just step in and say, you know, now this is the problem here. <laughs> I preached uh, at, a, at a meeting not too long ago, and, and they, they, you know, they got to shouting, and I believe in shouting. We run the aisles and roll in the floor and all that kind of business. But... Uh, it was just a unique thing. And, you know, you, you, you evangelize and then you go to a place and you see something you've never seen before. And uh, this, this fellow fell in the floor and he was just, it looked like he was having a, uh, a, a uh, uh, seizure. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not making fun. You're going to get my point in a little bit. But he was just shaking, you know, he was just shaking all over and... He didn't use his hands, and he didn't use his arms. He didn't use his legs. 
But I watched and I saw that man scoot all the way across that floor. Across the floor. I mean, it was like, you know, 20, 30 feet, you know. I mean, he's just, and he's got this, I had just never quite seen it like that. I, I wasn't trying to be critical, but, but I, you know. And man, the service got to move a little more. And, and then I saw another fellow fall in the floor. And it was just amazing. I saw him doing the same thing. And then a little bit, another one hit the floor, and another one hit the floor, and all over the floor, everybody was doing the same thing. It, it, it just kind of discredited a little bit to me. And, and I, you know, I'm not really wanting to judge it or, or, you know, thank God, hallelujah. Something is usually better than nothing. But you know, you, you go to these places and everybody's doing the same thing as soon as the music starts. They're doing the, the, old, uh, the old foot shuffle, you know. And all of them's doing exactly the same, you know. <laughs> you know. And so, you know, people you know, probably look at them, they get the same, you know, their vision, and they say, well, man, what's wrong with these people? Now, if there's a variety of the way things are done, you know, but it, it, you've got to admit it, it's kind of strange and you wonder how much it is that that's really them and how much they're just, everybody's trying to copy probably somebody that's very spiritual in the church. Hallelujah. Even in our worship, there ought to be some diversity. You know, you do it your way and I do it my way. And, but, you know, we all need to be doing something. Hallelujah. All need to be doing something. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. They used to say of one preacher, a great preacher. I'm not trying to make fun of him, but a great preacher in our area. Hallelujah. They used to say, man, he's really getting with it when his left eyebrow start, he starts raising a little bit. Hallelujah. Lord, help me, Jesus. But what we find in this story is we, we find... We find every person is performing his own work. And at the same time that he's doing what he's supposed to be doing, he's there to help his neighbor with their particular work. You know, we're not all cut out for the same thing. Uh, you know, I've got men in my church. One man can perform with ease a certain task that another man will literally destroy what's needing to be done. You know, I, I've had people work on some of my stuff, and man, I, I regretted that I ever let them work on it. They just wanted to give it a shot. Uh, they just wanted to give it a shot because they, they wanted to help the pastor. Hallelujah. I remember several years ago, my, my nephew, you know, this is just off the cuff, and so... I'm probably going to get in trouble with, about this, but br Brother Mark Copeland, he always thought he could just do about anything need to be done, you know. And, and so, uh, you know, he he was needing some money. This is back, he's a teenager, and, and I had bought a new truck, and I was fixing to go get a brake system, electric brake system on it, you know, put on a fifth-wheel trailer. And, and uh, you know, he said, man, I can do that. I said, well, you know, I, you know, I don't know. And, he said, oh, yes, said, I need the money anyway, and I can do it. And, uh, and so uh, I said, well, I, I know I'm going to spend the money. And if, you, if you can do it, you do it. And so he hooked this brake system up for me, and I hooked up a big 40-foot fifth wheel and headed to uh, Dallas, Texas to preach a revival. And, man, I, I, I done real well until I took the exit to the Box Springs Church. And when I took the exit and I stopped at the, the stop light uh, just uh, just a little ways from the church all of a sudden smoke was boiling out of my my hood area and man i jumped out and and jerked the hood open and that thing was on fire <laughs> and uh, it burnt everything off that motor it burnt all the, the spark plugs and wires and the electrical wires and thank god there was a man at the church that didn't know what he was doing and and he wired everything back on. I was in there revival for a while, so he had plenty of time to work on it. And we got that baby running again. I, I, I've seen, you know, I, th there's guys that are masters. I've got some master craftsmen 
Uh, I've got men that work in multi-million dollar houses. Uh, they, they know how to build. And, and it's, just, it's just amazing what people are gifted with their hands in doing. You know, uh, we're blessed at times when we get ready to build a church that we've got people that are talented and, and uh, they, there are certain things that, that they can do and they can do it as good as anybody can ever do it. But, you know, there, there's other people that you don't really want them to get involved in doing some things. Hallelujah. Now, I'll tell you what happens to us so many times is that uh, the carpenters and the bricklayers and the, and the painters and uh, the drywall men, they get all involved in helping the church being built. And uh, they're, they're, they're waiting for uh, the computer geek to show up. You know, everybody ought to be working on this project. Did you know there's a lot of churches that have church problems? They, they almost, in fact, there are churches that, that split when they have a building program. And the reason they do many times is because that those that are doing the work gets disgruntled with those that are not doing the work. And sometimes we don't have enough sense to realize that would be some people would be better to just stay away. Now, I don't want a carpenter probably to work on my computer. I had a, one, a young man a while back that he, he, was, he was persistent about he wanted to help me. And I, he said, I needed a room painted. He said, I, I can paint. And I'd never seen him paint. And he painted, and, and he, painted, he painted everywhere, all over the floors and the ceilings. And so it was worse than... You know, and so not all of us are cut out by the, for the same thing. Hallelujah. You know, there's no such thing as perfect genius. You know, uh, Albert Einstein, brilliant man. We've all read about it. And, uh, but they, they claim he would get these things rolling over in his mind, you know, stars and universes and, and uh, equations and, uh, and all this kind of business. And he, he, was, he was so... Caught up in, in these things that we think, man, this is the smartest man that's ever lived. But I, I'm told that at times he could not even tie his shoes. There were times he was so involved in, in, in that he couldn't find his way home. I want to tell you, everybody needs somebody. Everybody's got a blind spot. We got a preacher in Pentecost that he, uh, everybody's talking about how smart he is. Well, when he was evangelizing, he, he didn't, he couldn't keep his holding tank working right. Mr. Genius. He just couldn't get it that you got to keep enough fluid in there that when you pull that plug, it'll all come out, you know, and you won't get stopped up. He was forever having problems. He put duct tape on everything. And he's a brilliant man. One of the greatest preachers I've ever heard in my life. But he gets all stopped up, you know what I mean. And, and so he's going to try to get that thing unplugged. And he's the type of guy he's built for the office, not for framing a building. And so anything he can do sitting down or laying down, he's going to try to do it like that. And so he's got the lid off that deal. And he gets him a coat hanger. Now, we're talking about 50 gallons, all right? It's one of those big operations. And he lays down where he can get a real good look at it. And it starts jabbing that thing. Do we have anybody here smart enough to realize what happened to him before I tell you? Mr. Genius. Of course, you know. I 
I want to tell you, we're all fearfully and wonderfully made. And there's one thing that most of us have problems with. We short sell ourselves. And we're always wanting to do what somebody else can do. We're always wanting to sing a special when we ain't got no business singing a special. I told this church the other night, they wanted me to sing, wanted me to sing. I, I tried to sing, when it, especially when I was evangelist, and, you know, I'd try to sing a little bit. You don't have to sing good when you're the evangelist. And you can make a tape, and people will buy it if you're an evangelist. <laughs> Hallelujah. Of course, we've got some good evangelists that can really sing. But, you know, I told them, I said, i got a good voice. It just gets ruined coming up my throat. <laughs> Hallelujah, but... You know, I, I want to sing a special. I, I want to sing a special. I'm going to quit the choir unless somebody lets me sing a special. Can't you see any value in, in just everybody up there singing together and harmonizing and, and, and choosing that person that, that, that does so good? You know, maybe not the same person all the time, but you know, they got a good solo voice. We even got some decoys in our church that sing that can't carry a tune. We just try to turn the mic off. But you know, they're excited. And man, they just enjoy it better sometimes than the ones that do seem well. But oh God, spare us. We don't need to see, hear everybody sing a special. I got some ladies in our church that are, they are tremendous cooks. Oh yeah, I got fruit to prove it. We got other ladies, they, I, I don't want them bringing anything. This one lady, she cooked some cookies for me, and it was, it was like ice hockey pucks. You know, I, I believe there's a, there is a ministry in, in cooking and, and bringing food to sick folks and being there for them when, you, when they need you. I believe that. But I told some of them, I said, you, you, if you don't know how to cook, don't bring your food to people that are severely sick. You could push them over the line. But the Lord help us. We've got some men that are constantly want to do things that they're not equipped to do. And so all they can do is spend their lifetime talking about what they don't have instead of using what they do have. Every person in this building is valuable to the kingdom of God. And I'm going to tell you, the work is unbelievable what needs to be done. God give us a revelation, men that are in the pulpit, that we can see the talents and the abilities that's sitting in our own church. Hallelujah, just kind of tongue in cheek, you know. Sometimes we see all the talent in other people's church. Some people go fishing for it. And we never realize what's in our own church. And trying to facilitate people and, and train them and, and let, them, let them see the value of what they're doing. Hallelujah. Anything you're doing is ahead of what the world's doing. One man said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the ungodly. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everybody's needed. Everyone is fearfully and wonderfully made because God doesn't make junk. I'm going to tell you one of the biggest struggles that we face is... Men and women and boys and girls finding the place that they ought to be. Finding what they're most adapt for. And then here's a real kicker. Being happy and content to do what they can do. I want to tell you, a good usher is unbelievably valuable. A good man or a woman standing outside being the first one to make a first impression that knows how to handle people and just be kind and sweet and to smile and to see the value of what they're doing and to realize, you know, I'm the first key person here to let somebody know, hey, we care about you. We love you. We're glad you're here. We're excited that you've come for the first time. You're going to enjoy this church. 
I want to tell you, it's one thing for the preacher to be saying it. It's another thing for people in the congregation to be saying it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. A traveler was standing outside Cologne Cathedral. And he was admiring the beauty of that architectural masterpiece. He was talking to just to himself and anybody around, oh, this is so beautiful. And there was a, just an ill-dressed common man that was standing there and said, yes, said, it took us many a year to build it. It was said that that man turned with a sneer and said, took you. He said, what did you do? And humbly, but with, with an understanding and a pride, he said, I'm the man that mixed the mortar. Well, where would the cathedral be without mortar? Where would the beautiful stones be without mortar? You know, we need a good baptism of the spirit of the Gershonites in the Old Testament. That was the eldest son of Levi, I think. He was passed by and the Kohites were chosen to do the, 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 the priestly work in the temple. But the Bible says these men were burden bearers. That's what they were. Burden bearers. When it was time to take the tent down, the furniture and all that, they were the burden bearers that, that carried those sacred things. You know, it's amazing that all through that period of time, I never read of one complaint against, uh, that came from these people. Can you imagine that? Uh, what kept them motivated with the weight on their shoulders? Maybe, maybe it was a piece of furniture that they gave themselves. This was what they moved, and they gave themselves the study and the, and, and the uniqueness and, and, and whatever they might could discover about the value of that candlestick, or whatever. No doubt they put value in what they were doing. They realized, hey, if we're going to move when God moves, and we're going to be where the presence of God's at, and we're going to be where the man has fallen from heaven, and we've got to get this thing and move as God moves. Is anybody listening to me today? You know, Paul at one time said, I will magnify my office. Second Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 1, Solomon determined to build a temple for the name of the Lord. And the Bible says in verse 2 that he counted out 70,000 men to bear burdens. 80,000 men to be stone cutters. And 3,600 to be overseers. I told a group a while back, they was asking me my opinion about a few things. And I said, well, I think we've got all chiefs and no Indians. Oh. Thirty-six overseers. Eighty thousand stone cutters. Men that were pouring their self in. Their abilities, their talents into so perfected cutting of stones that there would be no sound of the two when they erected it on the building site. Men that maybe lived and died before they ever seen this building built. But they realize what I'm doing is, is going beyond my life. I'm influencing people. In coming generations. I'm building something that's going to last. How many is thankful today that we're just here? And God's given us whatever work it is to, to get done. And My God, help me to see the value. The value of being counted in the number. I've been blood bought. I've been baptized in His name. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. I've become a part of the body of Jesus Christ. 
Hallelujah. This is not some deal that's going to pass away. And to think that my children's involved in this. And if the Lord tears, my grandchildren are involved in this. i got to find out where God wants me to be and I want to do it with dignity. I want to do it with devotion. I want to do it with faithfulness. I want to do it with a good attitude. If I'm going to be mowing the church grass, I don't want to spend my time fuming, worrying about, wonder why this brother's not here, this brother's not here. And I just don't understand. I think I'll change churches to understand the value and the, 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 the privilege of being a part of something that God bought with His own blood. Hallelujah. Matthew 10 and 41, He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple. Verily I say unto you, he shall not, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Every one of us has a place. It's a blessing to be a part of God's work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I have found in life that the happiest people in life are people that are busy. If you, want to, you need something done, don't find somebody that don't have anything to do. It's always sitting under the shade tree. It's not that he don't have anything to do. He just don't have any ambition. Find somebody busy. Find somebody busy. They're the happy people. They are the contented people. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God is different from the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of the world, it's built on competition. It's built on meeting a quota. It's dog eat dog. The kingdom of God is the first should be last, and the last should be first. The greatest among them all is the servant of them all. And everybody gets basically... In some ways, the same reward. Hallelujah. The men in this text were finding pleasure and enough in what they were doing. Every man saw value in the work of his neighbor. That's right. We can learn some lessons from idol makers, from devil worshipers. It's amazing how many craftsmen's hands these these idols passed through before they were completely made. We're living in the age of the specialists where people specialize on certain things. That's the reason we're scared to death of if something happens to our power grid, if something happens to America. And, and you, you know, we, we don't know how to take care of ourselves by ourselves. We are dependent people when it comes to the natural things. Hallelujah. We need a fresh revelation of our dependence to our spiritual brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. To our pastors. Hallelujah to, 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 uh, to other people in, in the world that are believers in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah in this great gospel. And so the Bible says here, the, the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith. And he that smoothed with a hammer, he that smote with the anvil. Until it was ready for the soldering. Look at all the different men that were doing different things. And then the guy fastens it with nails that it should not be moved. Everybody realizing I've got a job to do. Hallelujah. Anything that we have today is things that has been passed through the hands of, of many people. Charles Schwab made this statement years ago. He said, I, would, I have yet to find a man, however exalted his station, who did not do better work and put forth greater effort under a spirit of approval than under a spirit of criticism. Hallelujah. You know, if we're so busy, we don't have time to tell our brother, hallelujah, that we appreciate what they're doing or to give them a, a cheery word. And to say, I I appreciate what you mean to us and our church. I'm going to tell you, we're too busy. We can get busy doing what we're doing in the church. You you know know what? I have given positions to to people in our church. And I know this is on Holy Ghost Radio. uh, But so be it. And I I have given positions to people that 
As soon as they got the position, everything, everything changed. I mean, sometimes you don't know who people are until you give them a chair to sit in. You give them a position. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you what, man, I highly value. I'm not afraid to delegate work. I'm not afraid to delegate authority to people. I just feel like if we're going to get the job done, I'm praying God raise up preachers. Hallelujah. God's allowed us to have some, some preaching points outside our church. And, and uh, God, we're, we're just believing you. Hallelujah. I believe ten preachers preaching on Sunday in different areas are better than, than just one preacher preaching somewhere. I believe it's more than trying to build a big building and see how many people I can get under one roof. I want to find out the best way to reach our city, to reach our community. Hallelujah. God can raise people up. God can equip us. If you need something you don't have, God can literally give it to you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And so the, these folks, they were, they were busy doing their work, but they were conscious of, of others. And there was a, a good word for everybody. A word of encouragement. Everyone encouraged his brother. Everyone said, be of good cheer. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Philippians 2 and 4. Let... Each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned. This is in the Amplified. For not merely his own interests, but also each for the interests of others. Can I be transparent? A few months ago, I was in, the, in our church and I was praying. And, and uh, oh, I, I try to live and breathe revival. I, I was praying for our church. You know, it's one of those days that I just, the spirit of prayer I thought was on me. And I was crying and I was praying. I said, God, please, Lord, help us to, I know there's more you're wanting to do. I know, God, we got too much humanity involved. And we, I want the spirit to do what only the spirit can do. And I was praying, God, fill people with the Holy Ghost. We got some people in the altar that needs the Holy Ghost. And, and uh, I just, I just, I just, Kind of really feeling pretty spiritual. And God just out of the blue just spoke to me. I mean, it's like he just interrupted me. I, I guess I was off on some rabbit trail by myself. and Maybe my motives wasn't right quite. Quite right. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's what it was. All of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me and said, and I said, God, I want to see somebody get the Holy Ghost. I want to see these people get the Holy Ghost. And I, he said, do you get as excited about people getting the Holy Ghost in other churches as you do in your own church? It's a little embarrassing, ain't it? Are you as concerned about other churches around you as you are about your own church? Now, I think we ought to be concerned about our church. I refuse to be satisfied to have an empty altar and people not getting the Holy Ghost. Oh, yes. But at the same time, we can get so involved in what we're doing. You know, it doesn't matter who here today, any preacher or church here that is represented. You go in the morning and, and you're having Sunday school and somebody gets the Holy Ghost. It, it, it's a blessing to all of us. Because it's not all about our local church and what we're just doing in our own church. It's about God's church throughout the earth. Oh God, wherever, wherever you're going to drop it, just drop it, God. Give us revival, God. God, oh God, do the work, Lord. Help us to delight ourselves, not just in what we're doing, but what other people are doing around us. And friend, it happens in the local church. You give somebody an office and all they're, all they're interested in was just that one thing. You put somebody over outreach and we have outreach on Saturday. Hallelujah. Not everybody in our church comes to outreach on Saturday. Now, I believe to a degree that everybody needs to be reaching out and be an example of nothing more than just, just being who you are. 
is a light. But everybody in our church don't take that time to come on Saturday. There's some people that are doing other things around the church. Some things are common things. But they become spiritual things when we do them unto the Lord. It's like the money that we give that becomes eternal. And so, you know, what you get is you get this deal where somebody gets in a, in a position and then it's all about that position. And anybody that's not there uh, uh, under their authority, you know, uh, they're backslid or they need to pray through or whatever and there's a dissension. So whatever we're doing, we need to do it unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I'm a good painter and I, I, I had a man call me this week. To get permission to paint uh, our auditorium. And he's a, he's a professional painter. He's in our church. He said, I got to paint. And, and he said, uh, uh, if it'd be all right with you. Well, you know, it wouldn't be. It, 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 it just excites me as while he's painting, as long as he keeps his eye on the painting. Hallelujah. He can just feel the Lord and talk in tongues and realize he's doing something too. Are you hearing me? Hallelujah. When everybody gets, everybody's valuable. Everybody's important. But, you know, we need to see the big picture. We need to see the big picture. I believe if I could just make just one mention, you know, with, with we as pastors. Oh, God, help us to some way, as, as far as possible. We need to unite ourselves together. There needs to be a trust. And there is a trust. But... Oh, a, a greater trust and believe in each other that, hey, I'm not out to see what I get from you and reaching in your congregation. I don't want to feel any kind of jealous attitude toward anybody. I, I don't want to compete with you. I want to complete. I, 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 want to, I want to help you. If I can help you in any way, be better. While you help me and add to my life. I don't want to have tunnel vision. I don't want my motives to be all twisted up to where 95% of what I'm doing, I'm doing it because it's my church. Well, it's really not my church anyway. It's the church that Jesus Christ purchased with His own blood. Hallelujah! 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 And it's not just my ministry, you know. You know, I remember the, the feelings that I had as a young man. And, and you know, I just burning inside. And, and I, I'm still trying to maintain that burning inside. But I, I remember when my value system was still developing, you know. And, and you, you know, and my ministry, my ministry. And, and it goes beyond what we physically do. And what we do even, you know, I, I've been a sick man a few times in my life when I could have died. In fact, around ten times, different, different things that happen. And uh, I realized that I, I, I you know, I, I could get to have a stroke, be in a wheelchair. Somebody else could take my seat. Somebody else could be preaching. And I'm using that pronoun, my, to my pulpit, but really and truly, you know. I would hope if I sat in there, whatever I could do, I would still have the same, oh, God, do it, Lord, do it tonight, God. Oh, bless that new pastor, God, to go further than I've ever been able to go. Oh, God, do the work that you want to do in the earth, Lord. Hallelujah. God, help us, Jesus. Hallelujah. I preach in places where you know you, you, you felt like asking people to stand up offer a word of criticism instead of a word of encouragement. I mean that's all you heard. Would you please offer a word of criticism? It's all the bad, it's all the terrible, it's all the ugly. And again, I don't think that we ought to stick our head in the sand. But at the same time, you know, uh, we don't have to know everything about everything going on. And I'll tell you what, I don't, I don't, I don't like to be a mailman to just, just spread it all over the country, you know. 
But you know, we, we need each other. And uh, uh, you know, if we're not careful, if people are not noticing what we're doing, did you know we can become a depleted? Just being real honest with you. I'm a human and you're a human. And we like to be appreciated, don't we? We like to be appreciated. Sometimes we don't know what we're doing. We don't know if we're doing good or doing bad. And I hope to God we're not just preaching or teaching or working or doing whatever we're doing around the church just for a compliment. We need to realize who we're working for. We're working for God. And that's, that's the big balance on what I'm trying to say. But another thing that I, I, the other side of the deal is all of us, you know, we still got it in us. It's just in us. You know, we, 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 we you know, if we're out there by ourselves and where's everybody at? And maybe we're not wanting to have, get some kind of bad attitude or anything, but you know, I, you know, it, it'd just be good for somebody to come by and help me a little bit or, you know, uh, You know, a little baby starts trying to walk, you know, and they take off across the floor. And all of a sudden, they, they get a uh, poop and they end up right on their rear end. And they start crying. And probably the first thing they'll do is look at mama. <laughs> you know, they want some attention. They, they're wanting some help. Hallelujah. They're, they're wanting some encouragement that, hey, you can get up and walk. We need a little bit more of that around our Pentecostal churches. We need to open our eyes and look around and not just see what we're doing, but see what other people are doing. Hallelujah. And giving them a word of, of appreciation. Come on, brother. You can do it. Come on, man. I can see some improvement in you. You know, I appreciate the growth that I've seen in you. Hallelujah. You see new converts. They ain't got it all together. They don't understand. But, but to go by and say, hey, man, you've come a long way. Hallelujah. 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 That's an inspiration that comes to all of us when there's a little bit of appreciation. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't know that we can estimate the power, the invigorating power of an encouraging word. Just a word. Why do we keep silent until a man dies and then send our flowers? Why do we wait till a man's dead and then get up and talk about what he meant to us? How many people stands at a grave and say, I'm sorry that I didn't show you, Mama, how much I really loved you and appreciated you? How many dads that never could say to their children, I love you, because of a tragic accident and a child taken away, they, they weep and say, I never told him that I loved him. We're all expending energies when we work for God. We're not like God. God never gets tired. We get tired. You know, there's just so much of this right here we could take, and we've got to go home, do something different. No way to put a price tag on this. God only knows the virtue that flows out of a man that preaches Sunday morning and Sunday night and pours everything he can into it. You men that are here that are laymen in the church, good faithful men that mean so much to the work of God. You can't imagine. Somebody, somebody said, oh, I love that song. It'll be Sunday every day, by and by. God, I hope it's not Sunday. Somebody tried to tell me, you know, I just, I just sometimes, I just don't feel like coming to church. I said, well, join the party. I don't feel like coming to church either. There's time I don't want to go to church. Kind of like the guy that was in the bed sleeping. His wife, his mama hollered and said, son, get out of bed. You got to go to school. He just lay there. 
Son, get out of bed. You got to go to school about 10 minutes later. And he's still laying there. Son, get up. You got to go to school. Mama, why do I have to go to school? Because you're the principal. <laughs> Hallelujah. This man bids his brother be of good courage. This man that helps his neighbor. I wonder, have you found your place? I'm fixing to be through. Have you found your place of labor? Are you working? Do you realize how valuable your work is? You know, I don't know how I missed this one here that's such a good one. Are you easy to work with? The greatest attribute you can offer your pastor and those around you. Is a sweet attitude and a willingness to work together. Relationship. It don't matter how much talent you have to offer. If you can't work with nobody. If you make everybody mad around you. That's right. I've seen some of the most talented people. They were so arrogant or they knew everything. They were so arrogant people couldn't stand them. If you want to cause something to go down, just put them in, 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 give them authority. And there won't be nobody coming. And you can act like everybody's a devil, but everybody's not a devil when that happens. It's you doing something wrong. You need to adjust your perception, your attitude, the way you handle people. When we're given authority, it's not an authority that we just, we, we choose to use just any time. We're using somebody else's authority. And there needs to be a responsibility. Goes along with it. But we're all expending ourselves. We're pouring ourselves out. You know, when Jesus Christ, a woman pressed her way through the crowd and touched the hem of his garment. And there were people thrown in him from all sides. And he turns around and says, who touched me? And the disciples said, people's touching you from all sides. How, how can you say, who touched me? He said, somebody touched me for I felt virtue go out from me. Amen. There's been an expenditure. There, there is something that has gone out from me and gone into them. I want to know where it went. Why? Because I've just got so much to give. And what I've given it, that's it. We have so much in life, and it's, it's over with. I want to know where it's at. I, I, want, I want to know where it went. And so there needs to be a replenishment. There needs to be uh, being in the body where every part of the body is furnishing to us what needs to be there. God only knows... What can happen in, in just this coming year if everybody would get on board? Everybody would get on board. Hallelujah. Sometimes it's a frustrating thing for a pastor to think, I got something urgent right here now. Now, who can I call? You know, there's, there's, there's a few men in the church that you know that you can call. If you got to have something done. And I know some of them are because they're not equipped to do whatever you need done, but I won't tell you we need more people that are ready. Hallelujah. That are interested in the work, the whole picture, the big picture.
that's willing to pour their self out and give their self and be whatever God wants them to be and be happy with who they are and what they are. And they're not trying to be better than anybody else. They're trying to be better than what they are. I'm not in competition with anybody else. I'm in competition with myself. And I'm 61 years old and I'm still not satisfied with what I am. And I pray that the Lord will give me a little more time and a little more energy. Because I believe the Lord wants to help us. And I believe there's some great people that I'm privileged to try to pastor that wants to help me and be a part of what God's doing. Let's have great revival. Let's find our place. Let's be easy to work with. Let's not be egotistical. Let's not take ownership of everything around us and dare anybody to touch it. Let's don't draw boundary lines and say, this is my turf, this is my territory. I've been teaching Sunday school for, for 20 years around it. I don't need anybody else in this classroom. Oh, to work together, to work together. Hallelujah. Why don't we lift our hands and ask God to speak to us and touch us and help us and invigorate us. Revive our spirit. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sometimes we need to build a bridge instead of build a fence. There's times to build. And he made another statement. And all the people shall answer and say. And he said something else. And he said, and all the people shall answer and say. Hallelujah. I want an answer. I want a response. I want to know where you're at. You know a pastor can do great things if he knows the church is with him. That we are united. That we are together. That we're working together for the one good cause of everybody. Hallelujah. We need to open our mouth and say amen. It's, it's been a part of this conference. Hallelujah. I say amen because I want the preacher to understand. I believe what you're preaching. Hallelujah. I say amen because I want the saints to understand. I'm with my pastor. I believe what the pastor's preaching. Hallelujah. I say amen for the hypocrite because I want him to realize that everybody in the church is not hypocrites and I'm with the pastor. Hallelujah. I say amen for the sinner so the sinner can realize. Hallelujah. The church believes what the preacher is preaching. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I say amen for the backslider to let the backslider realize the church is still the church and there's some things that, that we will never change around here. We're in it together. Everybody's on the same page. We are united together. We're marching toward victory. Hallelujah. We refuse We refuse defeat. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap. Come on. Let's get behind the work of God. Let's get behind the kingdom of God. Let's not that came to his mind, but he no offense. But there's time to build a bridge and realize I got somebody that can help me to be better, to do what I need to do. Bible symbols, symbolic objects, the rainbow, a symbol of God's covenant, a stairway, a symbol of the way to God. Thunder, lightning, clouds, and smoke, symbols of God's majesty. Thunder, a symbol of God's voice. Trumpets, a symbol of God speaking. The pillar of cloud and fire, a symbol of guidance. A throne. A symbol of God's glory. Dry bones. A symbol of spiritual death. White hair. A symbol of wisdom. The wind. A symbol of the Holy Spirit. Fire. A symbol of the Holy Spirit. Stars and lampstands, symbols of God's ministers. A signet ring, a symbol of authority. Arrows, symbols of God's judgments. 
a scepter, a symbol of God's rule. The capstone, a symbol of preeminence. A rock, a symbol of stability. The human body, a symbol of interdependence. Grass, a symbol of human frailty. Symbolic creatures, the serpent, a symbol of Satan's subtlety. Locus, a symbol of God's judgment. Beast, symbols of earthly kingdoms. A dove, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. A lamb, a symbol of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Symbolic actions, breaking a jar, a symbol of the destruction of Jerusalem. The cursing of a fig tree, a symbol of judgment. Washing hands, a symbol of innocence. Being thirsty, a symbol of spiritual need. Baptism, used for salvation and a symbol of cleansing. The Lord's Supper, a symbol of union with Christ. Anointing, a symbol of empowering by God's Spirit. Harvesting, a symbol of Judgment Day. Tearing garments, a symbol of anger and sorrow. Spitting, a symbol of contempt. Shaking off dust, a symbol of rejection. Sitting in sackcloth and ashes, a symbol of repentance. Lifting of hands, a symbol of prayer. Covering the head, a symbol of submission. Symbols expressing God's nature and character, God's face, a symbol of His presence. God's armor hand, a symbol of His power. God's eye, a symbol of His awareness. God's ear, a symbol of God's listening. God bless you. Thanks for watching.